Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. Welcome to my true crime corner of the internet. If you've never been here before, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years older. So if that's something you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload because YouTube is having a problem notifying my subscribers when I upload. So if you like my content, just click it. As you can tell by the title of today's video, we are going to be discussing one of the coldest cases ever solved using the method of genetic genealogy. But before we get into the case, we do have a word from today's sponsor, and today's sponsor is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is dedicated to bringing all of its viewers the highest quality documentaries. If you're someone interested in expanding your overall knowledge of an array of topics, then Magellan TV is for you. From some of the best filmmakers, and networks from all around the world. Magellan TV is also adding new content every week. You'll never run out of things to watch, and it can be watched anytime and anywhere. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. There's also no ads, so your content will never be interrupted. Out of personal opinion, their crime and mystery section is the best. My recommendation from Magellan TV is a documentary that I recently watched and it's called The Price of Honor. The Price of Honor is an award-winning documentary about the murders of teenage sisters from Louisville, Texas, who were killed in a premeditated honor killing by their own father in the year 2008. Through home videos, emails, letters, and diary entries, you get to dive into a side of the story that is much different than the one that is depicted to the media. The documentary is a new documentary that has been added to Magellan TV. As soon as I saw that it was up there, I had to check it out and it's honestly probably one of the best ones that I've watched so far on the service. If you want to check out Magellan TV yourself and dive into over 3,000 documentaries, you can click the link in the description of today's video or you can go to try.magellantv.com slash gabulosis and you can start your free trial immediately. Thank you Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and let's get right into the case. Genetic genealogy. The use of genealogical DNA testing together with documentary evidence to infer the relationship between individuals. Here on my channel we have discussed genetic genealogy a lot and how it's been used in recent years to give people their names back aka Jane and John Doe's and also solve cases, especially cold cases. Today we discuss one of the coldest cases solved using the method. Today we will be diving into the solved case of Susan Galvin. The Seattle Center in Seattle, Washington, an area spanning about 74 acres that is full of enjoyable things to do and attracts over 12 million visitors every single year, from shopping to festivals to concerts to restaurants serving delicious food. It's no wonder it's a place symbolizing fun for so many who have been there. The center was originally built for the 1962 World Fair, and then after that, it kept expanding and adding even more entertaining factors to it. The Seattle Center's landmark feature is a building that most people are quite familiar with, and that is the Seattle Space Needle. It is a building that is 605 feet tall and towers over the area. The popularity of this area back in the 1960s was very much how it is in today's time, of course, before COVID. They didn't have all that we have going on there today, but the popularity was very much the same. It was a place where most people in the area, especially young adults, teenagers, wanted to spend time at. It was a place where if you were going to meet up with somebody, your brain would usually automatically go towards, well, let's meet at the Seattle Center. But not every person who looks at the Seattle Center thinks of it as a favorable place to hang out because for some, especially the family of Susan Galvin, it's a place that will forever remind them of tragedy. A tragedy that took place 54 years ago. During the evening of Thursday, July 13th, 1967, at around 6.40 p.m., the body of Susan Galvin was found by a parking garage attendant in the Seattle Center parking garage located at 300 Mercer Street. 
Her body was located in elevator one of this parking garage. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Susan's reasoning for being in this parking garage to begin with was a pretty simple one. She often used the elevated walkway of the parking garage that went over Mercer Street so she could get to her job. Other than her job being in the immediate area, she also spent much of her spare time at the Seattle Center, like most people in the area. Susan's case was immediately taken very seriously by the police department because the job she was working at before she was killed was a job at the department. She was one of them. She was a records clerk at the Seattle Police Department. Her case was handled delicately. At the time, cases were not handled the way they are in today's time, and they really took the time, the extra time, to handle Susan's case. Usually they would do a quick run through of the area to collect what they could, move the body for further testing, and then go from there. With Susan's case though, they went over that elevator with a fine tooth comb. They collected all they could from the area before even touching her body. According to geekwire.com, the crime scene was processed using techniques available at the time. Fingerprints were lifted from the elevator and garage area. Autopsy evidence samples were collected and Galvin's clothing was entered into the department's evidence files. Homicide detectives Archie Porter, Dave Grayson, Henry Aitken, and William Sands began an investigation which lasted well into the next decade. They went the extra mile when it came to Susan Galvin's case. This was an area that, although very populated, there was always a great hustle and bustle at the time, it wasn't an area known for violent crimes. The police department didn't stumble across a case like this on the regular. And this time, it was like I said, it was one of their own. So they really took it to heart. And from the start, they decided to do everything they could to try to locate her killer. But catching her killer would involve DNA testing, and that was not around in the 1960s, and it wouldn't be around for quite a while. At the time, they did collect fingerprints from the crime scene, but they were unable to match them to anyone's. When it came to talk about Susan, it didn't start as soon as her body was found. It actually started in her place of work on the 10th, three days earlier when she didn't show up for work. On July 10th, 1967, Susan was set to work the graveyard shift from midnight to eight in the morning, and she never showed up. This was not like Susan. She was 20 years old, she was young, but she was insanely responsible, was always on time, and rarely ever missed work. Two days later, on the 12th, she was reported missing, and authorities started looking into her disappearance. It is estimated that she was attacked, sexually assaulted, and killed on July 9th, a little before midnight, as she was heading to work. Her body would have been located earlier in the elevator, but this parking garage was actually closed for several days. The reason for that is that usually if there wasn't a huge event going on at the Seattle Center, they would lock up the parking garage. News of her death spread fast around the area, and people for a period of time didn't view the Seattle Center in the same light. It was a place people were still going to, but when they went, they were heading home a little earlier or they were looking behind their shoulders at the turn of every corner. As popular as Susan Galvin's case was around the Seattle area, it would take over five decades to solve it. We'll get to the solving of this case farther along in this video, but for now, Let's take a look at Susan herself and her backstory. Susan Marie Galvin was born on December 31st, New Year's Eve of 1946 in Bedford, Massachusetts to parents Helen Galvin and Lorimer Galvin. She was the oldest of seven children. She had two sisters and four brothers, all who outlived her. In mid-1967, Susan was 20 years old and she had recently made a huge decision in her life. Her family home was located in Spokane, Washington, and a few months before her life was taken from her, she up and moved her entire life to Seattle, an area a little less than 300 miles west. She was a brave young woman who loved her family dearly, but she figured 1967 was the time to spread her wings and try to find her place in the world. Unfortunately, that would land her in harm's way. 
Within pretty much no time of living in Seattle, she made herself comfortable. She had landed a job she adored, she had an apartment of her own, and she was getting well acquainted with the area. She was this amazing person with this amazing personality, and Seattle was a very populated area, so it was not hard for her to make friends. She would spend most of her time at the Seattle Center from doing her grocery shopping to living the nightlife. Like I stated before, she worked graveyard shift and that can be scary for anyone. Susan though, for the most part, was fine with her schedule and she lived only a few blocks from her place of work. A place of work where she was extremely respected at. This was a woman who was doing something in her life that most everyone wants to eventually do and that's finally leaving home and creating your own life and she only had a small time to celebrate doing that. Susan's case was the main case that no matter what year you worked at the Seattle Police Department for after her murder, after 1967, you heard of her case. It was discussed in the department frequently and it was always on someone's mind who worked there. Only months after leaving Spokane, she would be taken back, except this time in a casket. Susan Galvin was buried in Holy Cross Cemetery in her hometown. Her life was over, but her story was not. Through the years, many theories arose when it came to this mysterious case, and one of the main ones involved a clown. Yes, a clown. Seattle detective Rolf Norton is a main character in this case, and according to him, a main suspect for most of this case was a clown named Punchy. Punchy was a man, I'm not entirely sure his name, but he was a man who dressed up as a clown and he would walk around the Seattle Center and do clown stuff, you know, like make jokes and make animal balloons, you know, just out there lifting spirits, even though clowns do the exact opposite for some people. A few things did look suspicious about Punchy. For one, Punchy was somebody that Susan had developed a friendship with, and whenever she went to the Seattle Center, she would always try to go find Punchy. They would talk and walk around together, occasionally holding hands, and this happened quite often. According to a witness, Susan was actually seen with Punchy only hours before she failed to show up to work. Not only that, but this clown, Mr. Punchy, he strangely quit his clown job only days after her murder. Now, he wasn't their man, he wouldn't be the one responsible, but I am a bit sarcastic when it comes to speaking about Punchy because of the way he acted. When he was brought in by authorities, he just genuinely seemed like he didn't care about the case. He was shrugging everything off and helping the case definitely was not his objective and it was quite obvious. He was just being very, very difficult. They did end up giving him a polygraph test and of course that's not the best way to prove someone's innocence, but he didn't pass, but he didn't fail. The results were inconclusive even though to many seemed like he could be their guy, they still had no solid proof to tie him to the case, so they let him go, and I'm sure he was pretty stoked about this. The thing that I don't understand about Punchy, which I wish I could use his actual name, but I was unable to find it, so I'm just gonna call him Punchy. Thing that I don't understand about him is that I know that he was looked at as a suspect, which of course, it's unsettling when you're looked at as a suspect in a murder case, but it didn't seem like he cared about Susan at all. It is known that they had this cute little friendship going on. I don't know if it was ever anything more, but apparently they just had this lighthearted friendship. And if you have a friendship with somebody, even though you're looked at as a suspect, you think that the person would still want to help the case and possibly give police any bit of information that they could come up with to help them locate who actually killed her or at least come in and be a little respectful but that was just that was not punchy there were other individuals that they looked at besides punchy one person was a sailor that she went on a double date with the week before she was murdered this person was completely cleared and then the other person was an ex-boyfriend from spokane 
And this person recently had a run in with the law, so they thought, you know, maybe this is their guy, but he also checked out completely. It would not be until the year 2002 when new evidence would be found. In 2002, homicide detectives in Seattle started looking over Susan's case again. Times were different, technology was far more advanced, and it was time to give her case another look. And good thing they did. They took some of Susan's items and sent them over to the Washington Patrol Crime Laboratory for DNA analysis. They were able to retrieve a male's DNA from her underwear in the form of semen. The first thing they did was entered the DNA into CODIS, or the Combined DNA Index System, which is a database for the DNA of convicted offenders, a database with over 3 million DNA profiles. They thought, okay, this is a horrible crime. He must have committed others. He has to be in the system. They were wrong. There was no match in the database for the DNA found from her underwear. So at this point, it was back to square one. Years passed again, about 14 this time. In 2016, Detective Rolf Norton was determined to finally solve this cold case and give her remaining family members some answers after all this time. In 2016, Detective Rolf Norton was aware they had the DNA on file from Susan's underwear, and he immediately wanted to test that DNA against their main suspect they had for all these years, AKA, Punchy the Clown. Norton filed the search warrant requesting legal authority to obtain Punchy's DNA. He flew to where the 76-year-old man lived, collected the DNA, went back to Washington, and submitted the DNA to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab for comparison. Within a few days, they finally had an answer. An answer they had been waiting for for decades. But it wasn't the answer they were expecting. Punchy's DNA did not match the DNA from the crime scene. So much time had passed since the crime, and although Punchy acted suspicious, he wasn't the man responsible, and it was finally proven that he was innocent. Obviously, good on his part, good for Punchy, but where do they go now? In 2017, Detective Norton had been with the department for over 20 years, and this was always one of the cases that stuck with him. He knew that back in 1967, the detectives on the case did a great job collecting information, and an even better job collecting evidence from the crime scene. He knew that in today's time, we do have the technology to solve it, and that it was just a matter of time before everything would fall into place. Only a year later, in July of 2018, the DNA from the underwear, aka the suspect's DNA, the killer's DNA, was submitted to Parabon Nanolabs, which is a DNA technology company located in Virginia. This company is quite confident in their ability to solve a case because their tagline is literally, solve your toughest cases fast. Parabon Nano Labs includes a service called Snapshot, though, and this service includes crime-solving tools like genetic genealogy. With genetic genealogy, they are able to create a family tree for the suspect and then go from there. This suspect's DNA profile was then reworked a little, cleaned up, and entered into GEDmatch. GEDmatch is an amazing service, and it is most known for solving the Golden State Killer case in that same year of 2018. Now, since the Golden State Killer case was finally solved that year in 2018, this gave Detective Norton so much hope for Susan's case. He was using the same service that solved one of America's most unsolvable cases. Parabon genealogist C.C. Moore, who we've discussed before in a previous case, she received the results from GEDmatch and started locating ancestral links to Susan's killer. She was able to find two very distant cousins. It led them to a man, a man with offspring still living in the Seattle area. So they asked one of these offspring if they could collect their DNA and test it against the DNA found on Susan's underwear. The individual was extremely helpful and cooperative. Their DNA was sent over to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab for comparison. This entire process went on for months and months, and after so much hard work, the results were finally in, and drum roll please, it was a match. They had a match. The case was not entirely closed yet because this man, whose offspring was kind enough to be so cooperative, 
was deceased. He had passed away years before, but he hadn't been cremated. So to finalize everything, they exhumed his remains to compare his actual DNA to the killer's DNA found at the crime scene in Susan's underwear. His DNA samples were submitted to a private DNA testing lab in Virginia called Bode Technology, where they were able to complete a full DNA profile on him. Then in April of 2019, his DNA profile was sent over to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab to compare directly to the killer's DNA profile. After nearly 52 years, they solved Susan Galvin's case. The DNA profiles were a complete match. They knew who her killer was, and he was someone who was never on their radar. Not once. Susan Galvin's killer was a man named Frank Whippich. Frank Edward Whippich was born to parents Edward and Lucille Whippich on March 9th, 1941 in Seattle, Washington, the same place where he would be taking someone's life 26 years later. He grew up in the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle and was a graduate of Pacific School, graduating in the year 1959. He went on to serve in the United States Army during the early 1960s, then settled down, married, and became a father of two boys. During the year of 1967, he was 26 years old, and only one of his sons was born at the time. His other son would be born about two years later. He worked as a security guard in the Seattle Center. He was known as a family man, a loving father and husband, someone no one expected to be the culprit of a gruesome murder that went unsolved for over five decades. Here is a very eerie photo of Frank at the Seattle Center about a decade after Susan's murder. He wasn't someone with a crystal clear, cleanly history though. In the year 1971, when he was about 30 years old, he and his first wife divorced. And a little bit later during that year, he actually committed larceny and went to jail for nine months. Then he was arrested for a weapons offense in 1975, four years later. I did read that relatives told authorities that Frank Whippich had gotten in trouble for impersonating a police officer, and while impersonating an officer in full uniform, he would make traffic stops, doing this while being armed with a gun. And this is what got him in trouble in 1975. When he was arrested, they of course took his fingerprints. These fingerprints on file were tracked down in 2019 and compared against the fingerprints found at the crime scene in 1967, and they were a match, further proving he was the one who took Susan's life. In the mid-1970s, he remarried and would go on to move around quite a lot in the area of Seattle, but never moving outside of that area, just moving to different neighborhoods. In 1987, he was living in the area of Farrell Way and he would eventually pass away on April 7th of that year due to complications from diabetes. He was 46 years old at the time. Like so many solved cases out there, there will never be justice served in this one. Frank Whippich did die before even hitting 50 years old and he went on to do things that Susan was never able to though. He robbed her of her potential. He robbed her of the life she could have had. One of the main questions that Susan's family had before is still one of the main ones they have in today's time. Of course, they always wondered who committed the crime, but the main thing they wondered was why? Why would anyone do such a thing to Susan? They still don't know that, but that is a question that no matter what the answer is, the answer will never honestly be enough. No answer will ever make the action okay. Some cases like this are a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Frank was obviously an evil man and I feel like if it wasn't Susan, it would have been somebody else. And you never know, there could have been others. In personal opinion, I'm not a professional, I'm just saying. Now that they do know that somebody who was completely not on their radar back in the 1960s was connected to one of the biggest murder cases in that area, I feel like they should look back through cases from the 60s and 70s and see if in Seattle, those cases can be connected to Frank Whippich because we do know that Frank Whippich did not 
really ever leave the Seattle area. So I feel like in my opinion, if he did commit other crimes, other murders, possible sexual assaults, they probably would have happened in the Seattle area. So I think it's, it's a good idea to look back at those cases from that time in that area and just see if DNA does connect to Frank Whippage. According to geekwire.com, one of Susan's brothers, Larry, said that out of everyone in the family, her murder, her death, losing her definitely affected their mother, Helen, more than anyone else in the family. All of Susan's siblings were younger at the time, so as they grew up, they found their own ways to cope and their mother just was never able to cope fully with what happened. Helen would go on to marry two years after the murder, so she did try to go on in life and find happiness, but she could never get over what happened to her daughter. From my research, Helen did live a long life. She died at the age of 77 in the year 2000, and she was buried in the same cemetery as Susan, not far from Susan, but she went her entire life, or the years after 1967, just with questions lingering in her head. I don't think she was ever able to live life fully after what happened in 1967. I personally think so often about the parents of the victims I talk about on my channel. And when you think about it, you know, both parents, but a mother, someone who carried their child for nine months, helped them grow, watch them become a person of their own and develop a personality. And you know that none of these parents ever thought for a second that they would have to go through losing their child in such a horrible way or that they would even lose their child to begin with. Like they always say, a parent should never have to bury their child. One thing that I also really wanted to mention that just genuinely tugs at your heartstrings is that they actually gifted Susan's brother, Chris, the flag that was flying over the Seattle Justice Center the day that Detective Norton officially solved Susan's case. That just, you know, is really sweet and I'm sure her entire family appreciates them for that. When it comes to cases, especially cold cases, I just thoroughly believe that there will never be an end to questions you can ask. There are cases that I covered four years ago that I did a video on and still have dozens of questions I wish I had answers to. No video or podcast or book or anything about a case there will never be an end to questions you can ask. But that is the solved case of Susan Galvin, one of the coldest cases ever solved using genetic genealogy. Without genetic genealogy, so many cases would not have been solved yet. Susan's case wouldn't have been solved. So many cases I have discussed on my channel wouldn't have been solved. I hope that every person who has ever committed one of these crimes is sitting at home realizing that so many advances have been made and there's a huge chance their time is coming to finally be caught for what they did. Before I end this video, I do want to leave off on a point that Detective Rolf Norton made and at the end of all my research for this video, I do have to say that I was like ready to start a Detective Rolf Norton fan club because he did such an amazing job solving this case and he just didn't give up on it. But anyways, he made the point that yes, Susan is the main victim and also her family is, but you also have to feel sorry for Frank Whippage's family, especially his two sons. His two sons are also victims in a sense because they went their whole lives not knowing the type of person that their father was. And the day that they found out, I'm sure that their entire lives came crashing down on them. And I just, I couldn't imagine going through such a thing. So my heart obviously does go out to them as well. Leave your opinions about the case down below in the comments and like always, leave some love for Susan's family down there as well. And remember, if you have any case requests that you wanna send over to me, you can email me at gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com. And also a huge thank you to Magellan TV for sponsoring another one of my videos. If you all want to dive into another true crime case after this video is over, go check out Magellan TV because they have been so kind to me, especially last year when things were so tough and 
Magellan TV honestly helped me get through a lot of my boredom last year. So I do thank them and they're a great company, I promise. And with all that being said, I will see you all in my next video. Bye guys.